Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. This is another one of those ones that people read or look at or listen to and go nuts over. What is he talking about? Who wants to mourn? Who wants to be sad? And I remember when I was a kid, around eight years old, in the backyard, trying to read this Beatitudes thing, trying to understand each and every one of them. Somehow I knew they would be very important. And when I got to this one, after the poor in spirit thing, which really blew my mind, we got to this one about, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. What did that mean? I didn't even know what the word mourn meant. So I went to my mom and I said, you know, what does this word mean? And she said, it's the feeling that people have when they lose someone they love. And I started to think about that a lot. I didn't get it till many years later in India when I was really beginning my practice and starting to understand the nature of what this is all about. When you live in the poor in spirit, when you and I are willing to drop our pride, our vanity, our ego, for the sake of the kingdom of heaven, meaning consciousness, something very unusual happens. We start to feel what we have done in our life, both to ourselves and, of course, to other people. Whatever you've done to yourself, you will have done to others, I guarantee it because we're all interconnected. This is all about a sense of oneness. When I was beginning my practice and really starting into it, that idea did not appeal to me either. Of course, my defenses were up so far that I couldn't see you know, why I would have to suffer this iniquity because I didn't do anything wrong. Everybody likes to think that. I did that because you did that, and if you hadn't done that, I wouldn't have done this, that kind of pettiness. But once you start meditating, truly working on yourself, you start to get the inference of the kind of things you and I have done, both personally and to the world. These things cause a great deal, first of all, of regret. And then later, as you start to mature more and more and more away from the emotionality and away from hate and fear, you feel a deep sense of remorse. This remorse is extremely important. There's a vast difference between regret and remorse. Regret means, well, I know I did something bad, but I'd probably do it again. The tendencies have not left. I still feel I'm a smidge self-righteous about what I did. And I have an excuse for what I did. I, I wouldn't have done that had you not said that, you know, or I wouldn't have done this if you hadn't been that way. That kind of thing. It's pretty ugly. But we keep it going. Most of the time for the rest of our life. We never enter into that thing called real forgiveness. After a while, after a lot of pain, after a lot of disappointments, after a lot of sorrow, you start to realize what karma might mean. Karma isn't you get what you sow, you sow what you reap, that kind of thing. That's the pedestrian mentality, the collective unconscious kind of thing, and it, it matters not. It isn't what our life is all about. Karma is seeing how we interact with life itself. That more than what I sow or the measure I meet, life meets me with, it's more a guideline. It's the actual path that I get to realize through meditation and not confronting myself in a kind of mean-spirited way, but rather beginning to realize that it is the Gregory self, the I, the me, the my part of me that created all of this through my genetic disposition. And once I start to understand that ever so slightly inside me, once that becomes enamored in my psyche, I think that no matter what I do, everything's right. It wouldn't matter what I did. When I start doubting that process of I, me, and I, and we, and us, and them, and all the stuff that we like to get involved in, which makes us feel a part of the self-righteous crowd, we start to feel deep sorrow. I have to let Gregory die in all of this. 
Gregory is a series of genetic accidents, a genetic disposition based on my DNA and my lineage and my forefathers. If you're not careful, you start living the life of your mother, your father, your grandparents, your family, your genetic family. And before you know it, you're no better than they are. You haven't progressed. Nothing has changed. You're continuing the lineage, but you're not maturing spiritually. You're not maturing in any way. You've made no change in your life. So when the pride is gone, the vanity has diminished, and you start to see what you're left with, in my case it would be a Gregory, and I start seeing the things that he said and done that he was so foolish about, so cavalier, so afraid to admit, I start to come into that very sacred place that most people won't go to, and it's called remorse. I hope you found the uniqueness of my message here on Aspire and that you will help sustain our effort both on radio and here on TV to keep Aspire on the air, to keep it serving humankind. We need your sponsorship to do this. Your sponsorship is what allows us to be here and to serve humankind the way we do. If you're interested, go to the website at aspire.org and go take a look at support. I deeply appreciate it. Now back to Aspire. There's actually a very good reason why people can't accept the Beatitudes, because their psyche can't accept it. Deep in the background as we read the Beatitudes, there's something in there going, no, 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 no. And I'll tell you what it is. Once you understand the price that you and I have to pay one way or another with what we've done in our life. We have to look at whether or not we're going to build our life in a new lifestyle, in a new way. If I have a great deal of regret for my life, for the things I've done, then I'm going to feel guilty and ashamed. And this has no place in a spiritual practice. It has a great place in religion okay but not in an authentic spiritual practice remorse is more what we're looking for where we see what we have done but in remorse we realize I can't ever do that again in fact we realize that we could never be able to do the things we did maybe when we were younger you know youth is wasted on the youth that kind of thing when we realize wow I did a lot of things that were very selfish and unkind. And maybe it's time for a, a very big change in my life. And the first part of this beatitude about mourning is to feel the sorrow that I have invoked upon my life. And number two, to realize I'm gonna have to drop Greg. I'm gonna have to let go of the I and me and you stuff and no longer live from my genetics and begin to see that I can live without it. Now, my ego is going to weep. My ego is going to throw a, a real tissy fit about this. And most people do not have the courage, they don't have the horsepower within to be able to go, you know what? Greg can throw the hissy fit, Greg can be unhappy, but I am going forward. The real authentic part of me. And I'm using the word me and I because there are no other words for this in our language. You are really a presence. The presence of something far deeper and more profound than you might imagine. The issue with us is, can I forgive? Will I forgive? And will I make restitution and amends for the way I have lived my life? Most people would never consider that. So what can I say to you? When you start to look at the way of our world, the way of life, the way we live our life, we have a lot to be remorseful about. But will I now make restitution, instead of feeling guilty and ashamed of what I've done, to change the way I live? And that's where the forgiveness comes in. Authentic forgiveness has nothing to do with being a decree. I don't decree, I forgive you. When people say to me, you know, I forgive you, 
You get that feeling. We all get that feeling. You didn't. You're saying that. You'd like to forgive me, but you can't. And then people have their little sayings. Forgiveness is, you know, forgetting and all that stuff. It's not. It's none of that. It is me no longer living from my genetics, from the background of what I think of that comes from my forefathers, my genetic heart of what's right and wrong, what's moral, what's immoral. Did somebody do you wrong? Well, guess what? You and I are as much a part of that when someone does us wrong as the person who did the wrong. And we don't really want to see that. That's not something we want to believe in because Victim is so very important in our culture and our society because when you're a victim, you don't have to take responsibility for that part of yourself and myself that engaged in the activity in the first place. I'm not here by accident with you. So whoever I'm with, whether they are somebody who's going to harm me, even physically harm me or not, I have a divine rendezvous with this person. And the reason I do is because... <laughs> There's been no remorse in my life. There's been no forgiveness. I can't stress enough to you the importance of what it is to truly forgive. People think this is outrageous. Are you saying to me that the person that hurt someone else, raped, killed, pillaged someone's life, that they're as responsible as the person who did it? Yes, I am. I'm not there by accident. None of us are anywhere where we are by accident. And if I'm in that posture inside of me where anger, fear, and hate are more important to me, I haven't done the blessed are the poor in spirit yet. All I've done is say, well, you know what? All right, I'm not going to have a, an I, me, and you. I'm going to just have a spiritual one, and I'll think of myself as spiritual. Won't work. We have to go through a process. Forgiveness is a process, and I'm going to give it to you in the next segment. It is one of the most important ones you'll ever go through. And the interesting thing about this forgiveness process is no one will talk to you frankly about it. Because A, they don't know it, or B, they know you won't do it. And that's the sad part. Most people in this world don't think they have to. They think of themselves as people who are in the know, intellectually know, and that's enough. But I'm saying to you, remorse and restitution are extremely important. If you didn't get everything I was talking about here on the program, you can download the whole series from the website at aspire.org. And for those of you who are sponsors, you can download them for free. The donation for them goes to purchase more airtime of our radio and our TV program, and it is considered, as I said, a donation. Order yours today, and if you're a sponsor, download them right away. Thanks for watching. Now back to Aspire. Welcome back. Well, if you haven't left me up to now, and you understand that everything has its rendezvous with us, whether you want to think it's luck or misfortune, it's not, it's karma. You need to consider what is the source of this? How does this happen to someone like me? And it isn't because any of us are innocent. I just want you to understand that we're in this world basically because of the kind of person we are, how we have lived blindly in what shall we say, cavalier emotionality, where we lived from the genetics and our emotionality more than we lived from the sincerity of our heart. The Beatitudes are about the sincerity level of us in a spiritual practice that is not defined by isms. It's not about Buddhism or Zenism or Christianity. It's about simply the way things are. If you achieve consciousness, which is very important to achieve, it will be done through something called forgiveness. I pound this home to my, <laughs> my, uh, my students at retreats and workshops over and over and over again, but they don't understand that forgiveness is a lifestyle. No matter how I tell them, it's how you live with yourself, your past, and everything that has happened 
in yourself as a lifestyle. So instead of living to compensate for what maybe I've done and try to forget what I've done and forgive and forget, which is foolish and doesn't work, I have to see that I have to make restitution for the things I've done in my life. What does that look like? I have to be kind. I have to be patient. I have to be willing to do those things for others that I need for myself. It's what Gandhi said. We have to be the change we want to see in the world. I have to be willing to make the changes I need within myself that would free me from my emotionality, from my guilt, my shame, my fear. And any chance I have to be remorseful, any way, shape, and form, to go out of my way in a remorseful way to help someone, to understand that I am helping them. And the reason I am helping them is not to be a goody two-shoes, but to change my energy, the level of my energy and what's emitting out of me, to change the quality of where I'm living and live in consciousness rather than in the conscience that makes me feel like guilt and shame is the only way. Religions don't go into forgiveness much. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors doesn't really mean very much. It's just words coming out. Until I'm willing to make restitution for the things I've done, to actually go and, and do things that are out of my way, what would that look like? Oh, there's a hundred million things. Taking a shopping basket to your car, unloading it in the car, and then bringing it back. Yeah, bringing it back to the store, not just leaving it there. I know that sounds silly, but it's a form of restitution, of doing things that make me unconscionably generous. If you're not a giver, you're not a good lover. And if you're not a good lover, you won't be able to understand karma. You won't understand the nature of karma and have the consciousness to bring you to a certain place inside where the presence of a deeper truth can be made available. But people don't like to be unconscionably generous. They think, ah, I'll let this one slip, or I can't afford it, or I don't want to do something that outrageous, like give of my time. It's all right to give of your time at a soup kitchen when it's Thanksgiving, huh? Just a little bit there, a little bit here. Tip the waiter maybe mm, a few pennies more. Those are the ways we think we're being generous. But what I'm talking about in being generous is being kind to those who despitefully use you, as Jesus talked about. Those people who are annoying, extremely annoying, and having the patience to forgive them and to understand, I'm looking in the mirror of myself when I'm looking at anyone who I have no patience for. This is how I change my life, my energy. No one is above me. No one is beneath me. And no one is doing anything with me or to me that doesn't have some form of my consent involved. And when I am being extremely selfish and I am only doing things because I want them to be the way I want them to be for the benefit of me, that is when I start losing my way. We live together, we're all one, and anything I do to you or you or you or you, even this discourse, will have a way of coming back to me in many different forms. You don't live as an individual. And if you think you are an individual, you're deluded. You're missing the point. We are all in this together, one way or another. And how I affect you through restitution and forgiveness, making my lifestyle something other than what I want, what I can get, what I can take away, it is more, what can I give you? How may I serve you? What can I do with you to make love possible? In this life, it's not important to be loved. It's important to be the love, to be loved. Please forgive me. Namaste.